My, um, if you look at my CV, you will see that my research has developed in three stages. Uh, I did my PhD in American literature, uh, writing on four American writers, great American writers, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman, uh, Henry David Thoreau, and Saul Bellow, three of them from the 19th century, and one of them from the 20th century. In fact, when I first went to Australia to do my PhD, um, my intention was to examine the influences of oriental mysticism on American writers. Um, I wanted to see how the influences of Rumi, uh, Hafiz, and Sadi works in the writings of uh, 19th century American literature. But because there was no one to supervise me on oriental mysticism, so I decided to move on to uh, a different topic, but keeping the basic writers, the three writers, uh, Emerson, Whitman, Thoreau, they were my primary interests. Uh, I moved on to examine their influences on a 20th century writer, Saul Ballon. <clears throat> and when I got to see my supervisor, um, she was very strict with me, and she said, well, you know, if you want to study American literature, do a PhD in American literature, you read the 65 novels. So she gave me a list of 65 novels and said, go and read them and then come back and see me. And you so, read all of them. so basically I had to read all of them. Uh, it took me about six months to read the 65 novels. Then I went back and reported and said that I've read all the novels that you had prescribed me, so what should I do now? So she said, okay, so what do you want to do now? What is your interest? And then I explained to her uh, that I want to examine the influences of three 19th century American writer on a contemporary uh, American writer uh, who is a Nobel laureate and he was living at that time uh, so she said yes that's a good topic so go ahead so I started writing and what is most interesting is that uh, when I started writing on Saul Bellow in light of the influences of Emerson, Whitman and Thoreau on the imagination and writings of Saul Bellow I established a contact with him he's a Nobel laureate he was a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, remember, in those days, there was no computer, no internet. Yeah. Uh, this is mid-1980s. So I had to write letters to him and wow. post the letters. And in fact, he started responding. So I was taken aback that this Nobel laureate, uh, a great man, most celebrated writer of the 20th century, he was responding to my letters. Uh, and he was very excited uh, that uh, someone was writing on his works in Australia. Uh, because he, there, were, there was many research on him in America and Canada, but I think I was the first one to write on his uh, uh, novels sure. in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's how my journey started. Uh, but when I came to Singapore after finishing my PhD, started teaching at the Nanyang Techno Technological University, uh, I thought that uh, you know, maybe uh, I should move to Asian literature uh, because physically I was located in Asia uh, so although I had done my PhD, and in fact I published my uh, PhD thesis, which was published in, uh, from New York, uh, Saul Bellow and American Transcendentalism, uh, and also published another book, which is called Saul Bellow, The Man and His Work, uh, where Saul Bellow himself has four interviews in the book. Um, I decided to move on to Asian writings, um, and primar primarily I started focusing on Malaysian Singaporean literature because I was physically here so I thought the best way to um, make myself useful would be to uh, study uh, the local writers and write on their thinking, uh, their social views, uh, their ideas, uh, their imagination. So that's how I started my journey. The second phase of my uh, research career uh, focusing on Southeast uh, Asian uh, literature, mostly Malaysian Singapore literature. And I wrote the first book on Malaysian literature in English with uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Noor, uh, Professor Noor Farida. Uh, we wrote the book which is called Colonial to Global. This is the first book on Malaysian literature in English, Colonial to Global, uh, Malaysian Women's Writing in English, 1940s to 1990s. Uh, this book came, came out in 2000. Was out, I was teaching at UPM. Uh, I was not even here, but we started working together. And then I brought out the second book, uh, these are authored books. I wrote this book together with Professor Farida, but this one, One Sky, Many Horizons, this book I wrote on my own, on Malaysian uh, literature in English. But since 2009, uh, I have actually moved to South Asian literature, uh, mostly 
uh, Indian writers uh, as well as Bengali writers because I'm a Bengali myself. Mm -hmm. So it's like a homecoming for me because after all this, uh, starting of writers from America, Malaysia, Singapore, in 2009 I decided to move to Bengali writers because uh, you know Bengali literature has produced many great writers. Uh, so I thought maybe I should spend the rest of my life trying to understand my own identity mm -hmm. as a Bengali. Uh, so I have translated some of the writers into English. One of the things that I must confess is that um, because I have sort of migrated to Australia, my daughter, my only child, was born in Australia. She doesn't speak Bengali. So I thought the best way to communicate my culture with to her would be to translate some of the Bengali writers. So I started translating the works of uh, Rabindranath Tagore. Dr. Kayum, so we can say that maybe, uh, what about your motivations to do this, this research, to, to go into this, this topic? Uh, uh, as your experience, or I am hearing now that you, uh, want, you have a personal interest in this, and uh, why you don't can describe your experience, your personal experience about doing research in literature? Uh, this this experience and this uh, these things that you were developing during your career. I think you know uh, research is all about passion. Mm. You must really love doing it. Mm. Uh, it's not about um, building a career or getting a promotion. There must be something inside you. It That's must be a compulsion. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a kind of a compulsion that you want to say something to the rest of society, uh, to the rest of humanity. Uh, so that is the motivation behind all kinds of writings. Now, I, I have not done my research for, to become a professor. I became a professor 17 years ago uh, at UPM. Mm. Uh, but I have continued to write. Uh, most of these books that you see in front of me came out after 2000 when I became professor. I so really, it's the interest to get into dialogue with the rest of society. Mm -hmm. You know, literary criticism is more like people are looking at books in a particular light, you want to examine them in a different light because yeah. you see the world differently. So you engage with the novels differently. So this is how uh, literary criticism works, uh, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other kinds of research. There are some points exactly about you were speaking about uh, how the technology is changing nowadays, uh, the way to do research. But I think it's good to go to a break, a small break now, and we can come with, with, this, uh, with this answer from you, doctor, if you okay, don't mind. Okay, yeah? thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we're back. Before we left for the break, uh, Doctor was telling us about his journey in literature, and we were asking him about the technological changes and how he adapted. Doctor, would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Okay, uh, so research is all about uh, progress. Research is all about advancement. Think about how research has contributed to the scientific advancement, to technological advancement that we have, we have experienced in, in the last 30, 40 years. You know, in 1951, two Nobel laureates, Einstein and Burton Russell, they said, they, they actually jointly issued a white paper where they said that, you know, if humanity can control their uh, fighting instinct, uh, getting into war too frequently, uh, then, in fact, science is going to transform this world into a kind of a paradise. Yeah. Now, we may not attain paradise, but notice the way science has advanced in the last 30, 40 years. Life has become so much easier. The world has become so much smaller. Uh, we can now move from one place to another uh, within hours. In yes. fact, one can have one's breakfast in Kuala Lumpur, lunch in London, and dinner in New York. So yeah. that's how the world has become now. Um, when I started uh, you know, studying at, uh, at Flinders University in Australia, in Adelaide, um, there was no computer. You know, there was no, when I began in 1986, there was no computer. In 1989, for the first time, they gave one computer to, f to 15 postgraduate students. Uh, in fact, that is the beginning of computer in Australia. And I'm talking about an advanced country, a most, uh, you know, a technologically advanced country, and yet there was no computer. Uh, then, of course, computer came, um, and then came uh, fax, and I was uh, excited by the arrival of fax. 
1991, I was sitting at, a, at an airport in New Delhi, and people were talking about email, but I had never heard about it. So I became curious as to what email is. This is 1991. Uh, so see how uh, you know, quickly we have moved across all this. And uh, now we have WhatsApp, we have a Viber, yeah. we can communicate with the rest of the people all across the world uh, f free. And In fact, you don't have everywhere. to spend a cent uh, to talk to your people. Uh, your loved ones, your family members. I speak to my daughter in Adelaide. She is living there on Skype every day free. So uh, see how life, the society has come together uh, because of this advancement in technology. Um, and it has made it easier because when I started doing my master's in Canada, I was typewriting my essays oh. uh, because uh, there was no computer then. Uh, this is Canada, 1982, 1983, I was doing my master's there, and I had to typewrite. And how do you edit something when there's a typo, or, you know, so difficult to edit when you're typewriting. You have but to now, do it again, no? You have to rewrite, <laughs> retype rewrite, it. Yeah. Uh, so now it's so, e so much easier, right? You can just compose everything on the computer, do the editing, and just print out. Yeah. Uh, so all these things uh, bec have become easier because of the progress in technology. Yeah. Mashallah. Well, and uh, what about uh, the, this uh, interest of of of, uh, of your research? What about the the people who is uh, around? What is the influence that they can take from from you? What is the knowledge that the people can take from your work? What is the yeah the, the contribution to the society? Okay, uh, many people have misunderstanding about literature. Mm. They don't know what uh, literature can do to society. You know, we can progress financially, mm -hmm. we can progress technologically, but we have to, we have to also progress culturally. Yeah. Yes. No society can be seen as uh, uh, advanced unless we progress hand in hand with technology, uh, financial sector, as well as cultural sector. And literature is at the heart of culture. That's true. Yeah. So unless we advance in terms of literature, in the field of literature, of course, we cannot consider ourselves as culturally advanced society. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ezra Pound, an American poet, once said, if the literature of a society is in decline, the society itself is in decay. Mm -hmm. uh, so literature is vital. Why? Because literature helps us to understand society. Literature helps us to understand humanity. Literature helps us to understand ourselves, uh, the culture around you. Um, and literature actually reflects what is going on around you. Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, had said in the ancient time that literature is the highest form of knowledge. In fact, literature doesn't confine itself to factual world. It goes beyond the factual world through the use of imagination. And imagination is very vital. Mind you, Einstein, a scientist, had said that imagination is more important than knowledge. Yeah. Because knowledge is limiting. Mm. Knowledge keeps you into the world of knowledge, but through the use of imagination, you can go beyond the world of knowledge and discover new knowledge. Yeah, in literature, there are uh, a process of, uh, of of creation, of creativity. The, the people or, or the writers can develop this creativity, imagination, and yes. try to construct <coughs> stories, novels. Yeah, yeah so see. writers are basically you know, observers. Mm. They observe society. So I might go to a train station and sit there for two hours uh, and I may not come back with anything if I'm not a writer. I might just mm. spend my time there. But if a writer is sitting at a train station, he'll be observing the people around him mm. and he might come up with a story on the basis of what he has seen. Mm. So he will be reporting about his surrounding, mm. the people that he comes across every day in his mm. life, but of course he'll be filtering his experience through imagination. So what is exactly what a researcher of literature uh, look for what what is exactly what the, the a, a, a person like you are looking for in in literature what what you are studying what is your uh, object of a study okay so literature deals with um, you know philosophical ideas mm -hmm. so for example when i read the english poets mm -hmm of the 19th century. They, were, they are called romantic poets. Mm -hmm. Now, the word romantic here doesn't mean romantic in the sense of uh, you know, emotion and all mm -hmm. that, or, or falling in love. Mm -hmm. uh, but romantic here means idealism. Mm -hmm. So they were idealistic writers. Mm -hmm. They wrote about nature, about the importance of the human soul. So that is where we go in. 
to study whether they were doing their responsibilities in the right way in the context of society and what was the objectives behind their writings. Mm. Uh, so idealism, romanticism is very important concept in literature. Now, at the, at the present time, we are living in what is called, in the literary context, is called postmodernism. Mm. So we have crossed mod, uh, idealism or romanticism, mm -hmm. we have crossed realism, we have crossed modernism. Now, in the literary world, we are living in the world of postmodernism. Mm. So literature has progressed. You know, when Shakespeare was writing, uh, the movement was called uh, Renaissance movement. Yeah. Uh, that is the beginning of the present state of civilization, uh, in a sense, because that's when Columbus had discovered America. Mm. That's when, when people started moving away from the theocratic worldview and uh, discovering the present state of life. We can say that literature is related to history also, to the stage of the society, and, and all, all, of, all of this, the, making research in literature combine all of these elements about uh, choosing a topic, about the, 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 the topic of the, of the writers themselves, the time where they are living, and how, uh, and how the historical aspects are influencing this literature, and how they are spreading uh, their point of view about the society. We can say that. Yeah, literature is about history, about society, about culture, about I human see. behavior. Human Mind behavior. Mind you, when mm -hmm. a writer is depicting a character, mm -hmm. writing about a character, he's basically trying to investigate the human mind. Mm -hmm. All right? So it's about, uh, it's an inclusive thing. So I think literature is the most interdisciplinary of subjects. When you study literature, you come across sociology. When you study literature, you come across psychology. When you study literature, you come across history, political science. In fact, my research, much of I my see. research, has been in the field of political science. I've written on nationalism. I've written on ethnicity. I've written on diaspora. Uh, I've written on gender studies. I see. Uh, so in light of literary texts, yeah. how these elements are portrayed by the writers in their writings. So what are they talking about women? in the writing. Mm -hmm. Are they talking about progressive women or backward women? Are they looking towards the past or towards the future or towards the present? Yeah. So we look at society through the uh, filter of the literary works and how the writers report about the society in their writings. Mm -hmm. It is very interesting because most of the people, actually the young people, the students, uh, uh, we think that maybe it can be very boring to do all of this. It's going to the <coughs> books, going to uh, this, uh, uh, the mind of, the, of these writers. And actually it's a lot of disciplines. We, we need a lot of, to combine a lot of the kind of knowledge to be able to conduct a research like this, no? You know, so, one of the, of course we have advanced a lot, but one thing that we have lost uh, and sadly, is a habit of reading. Uh, there is no replacement for the habit of reading. We must cultivate the habit of reading from childhood. And I, I always advise my students that if you start reading from childhood, you will find the world to be a beautiful place. And nothing like Im immersing yourself into a book and having a dialogue with the writer. So I'm reading Plato. I'm not just sitting there alone. In fact, when I'm reading Plato, I'm having a dialogue with the greatest mind of the world, Mashallah. Plato. Yeah, because I'm trying to understand his ideas. Mm. So I think uh, students should uh, cultivate the habit of reading. It's very important. And yeah. there's so much of restlessness in this world. Fighting, war, violence, yes. killing. Yes. If we had the habit of reading, then we would not be so restless. Unfortunately, so, with the development of technology, it kind of replaced reading nowadays. I mean, we can still read. In fact, many people said that after the arrival of Internet, books will disappear. Mm. But books are here to stay. Yeah. I mean, nothing like holding a book and going to bed and reading it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a yeah. habit. You know, we live by habits. Yeah. So what kind of habit, habits we create in childhood is important. Yeah. So if my father had given me a book when I was a little boy, I think I would start loving books. Yeah, sure. uh, but you can also read the books uh, um, through the internet, yeah, right? Yeah, so sure. I think books are there, books will survive. We'll continue to write books and knowledge will come through books. Yeah. You are right. Yeah. yeah. Let's, uh, I think it's time to go to a break, but I wish to, to uh, make a next question for, for the next episode. Maybe you can share us how to build this habit to read. For, to in, in between children and in, in the children in the children uh, stage, and also w w between among the students and teenagers, no, in the youth. So let's go to a break, and we we back soon.
we are back now. Uh, so let's let's go back to our uh, question: How we can build the habit of reading in youth? How can we be better readers? Okay, so I think habits are created in childhood. All right. In most cases, um, our fathers and our parents, mothers, they are the ones who give the habits to us. So, for example, somebody gets up early in the morning. Another person, you know, gets out of bed at 10 o'clock. So these are the habits we have created. And philosophers have different views as to whether we can get out of, of our habits and create new habits or not. Um, for example, a French writer, uh, Samuel Beckett, he's a philosopher writer. Uh, he's the founder of what is called existentialism, a movement in philosophy. He said that habits cannot be recreated. All right, so we uh, live by habits, we die by habits. Uh, and we cannot, once we have create a certain set of habits, we live to the, with those habits like the dogs, he said, this is a very powerful metaphor, like the dogs to their vomits. So it is, although the habits might be repulsive, we cannot come out of them. But other philosophers have said, no, that's not true. Really, we can create and recreate, construct and reconstruct our habits. Um, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, a 19th century American writer, he said, no, through the application of intellect, anything can be reconstructed. Mm. Um, so that is optimistic philosophy vis-a-vis -vis cynical philosophy. Uh, cynical philosophy of Samuel Beckett and optimistic philosophy mm -hmm. of Sa uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, now, I think uh, if, you, if a child has grown up with fairy tales, I think he'll be so much uh, drawn into the idea of exploring imaginative things that I think he or she will start loving reading books of all kinds. Uh, and then once you're hooked to books, I think it's very difficult to come out of that mm -hmm. because if you love reading, uh, if you have cultivated the habit of reading, then you continue with that kind of habit. And mind you, uh, r reading can be sort of intoxicating yeah. uh, because yes. once you start discovering other cultures, I tell my students in the yes. class all the time, yes. you know, you are the luckiest ones because you are constantly mind traveling. Uh, you are sitting in Gombak, but you are reading a novel by an American writer. Mm -hmm. Basically, you are encountering American culture through your reading. Mm -hmm. Or an Indian novel, you are getting to understand Indian culture. African novel, you are getting to understand yes. African culture. So you are sitting here, but you are basically encountering cultures from all over the world. Yes. And therefore, if you are a student of literature, you are supposed to have a very broad understanding of culture, of humanity, of society. And it cannot be parochial. It cannot be narrow in your outlook. Your horizon is likely to be very, very big uh, and broad. Uh, so I think these are the positive sides of uh, reading mm -hmm. habit. And I think, uh, as I mentioned I want, um, uh, earlier, I want to reemphasize that point of restlessness. Reading cultivates the habit of patience, yeah. the, the virtue of patience. So if somebody is looking at a book for the whole day, just black and white stuff there, nothing yes. really exciting, but you're creating the excitement in your mind through mm. the reading. Yes. You know, and the books, uh, you know, uh, Robert Frost, an American poet, once said, literature doesn't have meaning. Li the meaning is created by the reader. Yeah. So when you read and how you read, yeah. what you come with, what is your background, mm. is what the meaning will be. So if you are coming from an African background, of course your worldview will be different, right? Mm. Somewhat different from the American point of view mm. or South Asian point of view. And therefore your understanding of the text is likely to be different from somebody who is reading the same book from an American point yeah, of view. Sure, true, so right. uh, meanings are created by the readers. And that is the beauty of literature, that no one book has one meaning. Then all these texts would die. Think of this, Hamlet a play by Shakespeare, yes. there are at least 10,000 different interpretations of the play. And that is the beauty of it, that yeah. you read the play, you come with your understanding, you come with a worldview, and you explore the text in the way you understand it. You engage with it. Um, so I think literature is beautiful because it allows you freedom, it allows you creativity, yeah, it I allows you originality. Yeah, I hope yeah? that the, the students who are listening this uh, this uh, program can uh, go beyond uh, literature no? and try to discover all of this uh, magic in the books, no? yes. inshallah. inshallah. So, uh, we, we would also like to talk about some of your other writers. Uh, could you tell them about us a little bit more? Okay, I would like to uh, uh, introduce uh, one writer. Uh, her name is Rokia Sakaut Hussain. Yeah, I, I read a bit about her. You like to 
research her a bit more, right? Yes. And, yeah. I mean, you know, um, one of the reasons I have moved away from Malaysian literature, uh, I spent the best part of my life on Malaysian literature in English, about 10 years. Uh, when I first came here in 1996, I started writing on Malaysian writers until 2008. Uh, this is a, my last book on Malaysian literature, Malaysian Singapore literature. It's called Sharing Borders. This came out in 2008, published by Singapore um, uh, National Library Board. So that was my last significant piece of writing on Malaysian Singapore literature. Then I moved into Bengali writers, and I discovered a very significant writer, uh, Rukia Sakaut Hussain. I think she's a pioneering feminist, Muslim feminist in South Asia. And she was a very daring woman. She was very religious, she was very pious, and yet extraordinarily courageous. Sure. Uh, and she founded, you know, when she was uh, around, she was born in 1880, there was not a single uh, school for Muslim girls in India. I'm talking about the whole of India's subcontinent. There yes. was no Pakistan then, there was no Bangladesh then. It was just one India. Yeah. Pakistan was created in 1947. Yeah. Bangladesh was born in 1971. So before this, India was just one country. And she was born in India. So really, we can't say that she was born in Bangladesh, although now she belongs to Bangladesh. Um, and she lived in Calcutta, which is still part of India. And there was no school for Muslim girls, but there were hundreds of schools for Hindu girls. Yeah. So she came up with the idea. And she was never allowed to go to school herself. Her father is very orthodox, was very orthodox. So whereas Rokia's brothers went to England for study, uh, she never went to school. She, she was not it. allowed to go to school. Uh -huh. So she learned writing, uh, reading. Basically, she learned reading from her brothers. Oh, when the father about. would go to bed at night, uh -huh. they would lit a candle to use the light for reading. And that's how she came across the Bengali alphabets, English alphabets, and she became a writer. Mind you, in spite of all these challenges, the obstacles, she became a great writer. And I, th I think one of the greatest female writers of her time. Definitely uh, in Bengali literature, but I think in the whole of the subcontinent. Um, and she was not just a writer, but she was also an activist. Mm -hmm. So she founded a school in Calcutta. The school is still there, mm -hmm. uh, named after her, her husband. Her husband was a very benevolent man. Mm -hmm. um, Rukia was married. You know, India was at that time given to child marriage. So Rokia got married at the age of 16. Uh, the husband was 40 years old. Uh, and she, uh, she was the second wife of the husband. Uh, but the husband was very enlightened. Uh, the husband was very progressive. And he allowed all kinds of freedom to Rokia. And she became very daring as a writer. Uh, I think she's the first one in literature. I'm not talking about Indian literature. In the whole body of uh, literature, mm -hmm. who created a, a created a lady land where women run the state and men are confined to the kitchen. <laughs> you know, so, so I think this is 1905. Mm -hmm. More than 100 years ago, to think something like that was extraordinary. But she did. And the husband came back. The husband was a civil servant. The husband was away for three days. And he came back and asked Rokia, what did you do for the last three days? And she gave the story to him. Yeah? And he read the story um, without sitting down even. He stood there, read the whole story and said, what a revenge. So she, you know, the husband took it in a good spirit mm -hmm. that she was taking a kind of a revenge against men because women are confined to the kitchen. But in the story, men are confined to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So you can see that this book on Rukia by me, there men are sitting yes. inside the kitchen and women are free to oh, go around yes. and run the state. Yes. So that kind of imagination, I think, was very fundamental for the progress of women. Although maybe she was a bit, uh, you know, too progressive for her time, yeah. but I think we needed that mm. to open up the eyes of men that what men can do, women, women can, can do. do. There's yeah. no difference here, all right? We all come from the same God, yeah. and we all go back to the same God. Yes. So there should be no prejudice in society. Vision. No gender prejudice, mm -hmm. no color prejudice, yeah. no race prejudice. We must come together as a human race. And mm -hmm. I think that is very important. MashaAllah, that is so beautiful. I wish to read her books now. Um, we will go to one more break and then we will come back.
All right, everybody, we're back. We're towards the end of our program. And Dr. Khayyum, we have really benefited so much from you and all of the work that you have given us. You have given us so much to think about. We were wondering if you could give last words or maybe some advice to our view, our listeners that they can benefit from. Okay, my advice would be that uh, we should all keep our imagination borderless. Uh, we should be inclusive in our thinking. We should not be exclusive. We should go and read the best writers in the world so that we can become best ourselves. I think uh, it's very important that, you know, especially in a setting like Malaysia, which is a multicultural society, it's very important that we engage with people of other uh, race, other culture, other uh, and not be narrow about it. Mm. Engagement with the other is very important. So if we create borders, uh, gender borders, race borders, uh, color borders, then we become uh, prisoners in boxes. I think there's a Malay mm -hmm. phrase that says uh, that we should not live under coconut shells. We should open the shell and see the rest of the world. And this world is created by God. It's such a beautiful world. There's so much to discover. There's so much to know. There's so much to come across that we should not put ourselves into small boxes. Uh, that is my advice to all my Mashallah. students. Mashallah. Uh, Thank you, Thank so you much Doctor. For that, that is it for all of us. This has been Ayan and Gabby with you. Uh, inshallah, we'll see you next month for our next session. Gabby, inshallah. would you like to add anything? Yeah, uh, the books of, of uh, Dr. Abdul Kayyum, it's in the library in IIUM. So you can go to library immediately and try to, to read uh, uh, his books because he has a lot of, uh, lot of things to share with with the students and with the society. So thank you so much, uh, doctor. Uh, so uh, we can uh, stay, we will stay here, inshallah, the next month. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you for inviting me.